I'm not going to talk about each part of the brain, but instead I want to kind of focus on kind of the really the adolescent development, given the time that we have. Um, what kind of differentiates an adult from a child. And so we're going to focus on that frontal lobe. And the key things about that frontal lobe is that it's responsible for what we call planning, reasoning, and impulse control. Right? That's the big part here. You know, and if you think about um, where do children, where do teens most struggle, what gets them in trouble the most, right? It's planning, reasoning, and impulse control. Um, and so we're going to kind of walk through those aspects. But before we kind of walk through executive functioning and exactly what it means, I like to have some tangible examples, because that way you can kind of apply it. So I'm going to give you some what were they thinking moments. I'm sure you have your own personally and professionally in the world that you are, but I'm going to give you a few. If you want to throw out some, you're more than welcome to. All right, so here's one. So when a kid comes to probation, right, um, the standard routine is they walk in, they go through security, and security basically entails emptying their pockets into one of those little Walmart baskets, nothing fancy, you know, the little plastic baskets, walking through the metal detector. If it goes off, they get wanded, and then they go check in with the reception and ask for their probation officer. Not very complicated, right? And that's if it's at the main office. If it's at a field unit, they just walk in. Okay, so but at the main office, they go through the security. All right, so we have this girl that shows up to, pro, to see her probation officer, and Based on what we see, it looks like she's been there before. I mean, she's kind of, you know, she didn't come with the parents. She seems pretty casual. She must have shown up after school. Your typical girl, she's in, you know, like the skinny jeans and the hoodie. You know what I mean? And so she's standing in line at security. There's a few people in front of her. And so she's standing in line in security, and she's got her earbuds in, and she's messing with her phone. So she's just looking down at her phone. They go through security. Our security is really detailed, and they pull out nail files and if, you know, fingernail clippers for any of you that shown up at our office, so it can take a little while. So, so she moves up when it's, you know, next person's through. She's still messing. She moves up. Okay, so now it's her turn. So she takes out her earbuds, phone, puts it in the basket. Reaches in her front pocket, pulls out her house keys, puts it in the basket. Reaches around, pulls out a baggie of marijuana. <laughs> puts it in the basket. And so and she's just like bored to tears, right? She's just been there before. She's done it. So she's just standing there. And so our paid security guards are not the sheriff's. You know, this is a, not the sheriff's responsibility. So the security guard's looking down at the basket, and he's looking at her and looking down at the basket. And so she's still like, you know, so finally it, you know, and this is just a matter of seconds, but she it finally realizes that there's something wrong. So she's like, looks at the security guard, and he's like looking down at the basket. And so she looks down at the basket, and you can see her go, damn it. <laughs> right? So easiest arrest possible. I mean, they have it on tape. The, the sheriffs that are across the way come over, arrest her, walk her to detention. It's like, bam, like that. All right. So OK, hold on to that. Right? Hold on to that piece of what were they thinking moment. So here's another what were they thinking moment. Again, juvenile justice moment. So these three kids think they're going to get this wise idea to steal the cameras off a, a high school campus. Or maybe it's a middle school campus. It's been a while, right? So they're going to steal these cameras. So they also put on their hoodies. They grab some tools. And in the dark of night, they go to the school. And they're going to take these cameras off. And so you see on the footage, here's the camera. Right? Here's the kid. And he's like unbolting the camera, right? And he's like, ah, you see him like yelling and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I can see every little pimple and everything on this kid's face. OK, so they get arrested. They get, you know, they get picked up. And they have no idea how they got caught. I mean, they are just like, so they think that each other has like squealed on them, right? They're snitching. So they're like, well, he went to this campus and did this. And he has this many pills and then and then, right? So they're like. You know, just throwing each other under the bus. And so, again, no idea, even though they've clearly seen in the school office that there's like those multiple picture camera, you know, where it's all recorded and all that kind of stuff. So, all right, so that's another example. And so we're all like, well, yeah, these are juvenile justice kids. They've smoked a lot of pot, probably, or their parents did. And, um, you know, they've had a couple of head injuries. So, you know, but okay, so let me kind of give you another example. Okay, so my daughter is a swimmer. Right? Anyone have a child that's a swimmer by any chance? Okay. So other than Ryan Lochte, and I'm not nothing, they are normally very anal retentive people. 
right? I mean, they, because all they do is they swim back and forth in a 25 meter pool for three to four miles, right? I mean, so can you imagine? I mean, you've got to be pretty focused and determined to do that. So this is a long time ago when she was younger. Her club team would swim on basically a high school campus. That's where they would practice. So we pull up to this campus for practice, and all of a sudden I hear the high school coach screaming, what are you doing? And so I look around, and so I see this girl driving this car. So she's about a 15, 16-year-old girl. And she's moving at a pretty good clip through a high school campus. And I don't know if you've ever driven on a high school campus, but you don't drive fast on, you know, because there's speed bumps and, you know, young people pulling out of parking spaces without looking and people running out between, from between cars. Anyway, so she's moving at a pretty good clip. And she's laughing and the radio's on. And then next to her um, is a friend of hers. Okay, these girls are both on the swim team. So next to her is a friend of hers also on the swim team. And she's kind of hanging out the car and woohoo and screaming and things like that, which none of that's good. Right? That's not good. Um, but the key thing is on the hood of the car is another swimmer. Right? So he is uh, like the valedictorian or salutatorian of the school. And he has just gotten out of practice, and he is literally hood surfing, soaking wet on the top of this car, driven by this 15, 16-year-old girl, who's going at a good clip with the radio on. I don't know if he was trying to impress. I mean, he did have shorts on. He didn't have like the little Speedos on, thank God. But I mean, he, so he's on the car, like as she's driving. So, so this is an example. He is the I mean, he also has like a college scholarship from what I understand. He, you know, he wasn't a senior yet, but he was already set for like a division one school. So he is the brightest on that campus, <laughs> right? And he is on the hood of a car. So this, this what were they thinking moments is not just about those that, you know, are underserved or, you know, who've had histories of trauma or head injury. This is teens in general. Okay, and so we're going to talk about kind of executive functioning and what helps in that transition from the teenage brain to the adult brain. I'm going to talk about those pieces of it, um, and we'll kind of go from there. Are we doing okay on time and everything like that? I think we're good on time. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so working memory and recall. That is the first kind of p key piece of executive functioning. So what I mean by working memory and recall is the ability to store information, like you observe something, you learn something, you take that information and put it somewhere in your brain, but you're able to pull it back up when you need it. How many of us remember, we, we intentionally said, I'm gonna put it here because I don't wanna forget it, and then we forgot where we put it, right? Okay, so work, this is kind of the key to executive functioning is being able to file it in a place where you know where it's at, and then it pops up right when you need it without much effort. Okay, so let's talk about the girl that was in the juvenile justice system, the one that showed up to see her probation officer. Okay, so a couple of pieces of information, and not everyone's like, well, number one, why would you bring your pot to Okay, or why would you smoke pot? We're not gonna worry about that. I mean, that's kind of a whole nother seminar, and I don't wanna cover that one. Um, but why bring it to probation, right? You know you're gonna go, this is a set appointment, why take it? Okay. So let's say you know, she, was, she got it at school, which is normally what happens, right? They, they got it at school, and she went straight to probation. So she, you know, that's why it's at probation. All right. So, but why bring it into probation, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but we hear this all the time, those that are in probation, that when we ask kids where they found their marijuana, where they got their marijuana from, or where they got their weapon from, it, I found it in a ditch, miss. Have you guys ever heard that term, <laughs> right? It's like a standard, there is this magical ditch not just in San Antonio. There's a magical ditch in every city, even cities that don't have ditches, that somehow people find, kids find all this stuff. I mean, lots of stuff happens in these ditches. So, so why bring it? And, I mean, and the truth is really why bring it? I mean, all along her way, there were probably bushes and trees. And so we have now figured out that kids would put things in bushes and trees. So we have a sheriff now that walks around with a dog and smells the bushes and trees. So the dog is not relieving themselves. They're actually doing a drug search when you see them walking around. Our, um, but okay, so, um, so that's one thing. Why bring it into the building? Okay, but secondly, you know, you know you're going to go through this. You know you're going to have to empty your pockets. You know you're going to have to go through the metal detector. Um, 
Did she have to pull it out of her pocket? Was there anything that I told you about that screening process that said she was going to be patted down or anything like that? I mean, she could have stuffed it in a sock, you know, her inside of her pocket. I mean, there's nothing, right, that says she has to take it out. And it's not like it's going to set off the metal detector, right? I mean, it's got a little iron in it maybe because it's a green leafy substance, but not a lot. I mean, it's, it, we're good to go. I mean, so she really could have, you know, been wanded and everything, and no one would have ever known she had her pot. But did she think about what the day was going to look like when I show up to probation? Did she even think about, oh, my God, it's in my pocket right now, and I'm standing here in this building, right? Just totally, she, she knew she had pot in her pocket. She was not surprised about that. But, you know, later on, but did she kind of store that information in a way that was going to come up quickly, right? So that's working memory and recall. All right. The next part of executive functioning is what we call activation and arousal. Now, if you remember, I said that kids have no trouble with their sexual arousal because that happens earlier in life. Remember, it's the bottom up and the inside out. So that happens at the emotional center of the brain. What I mean by arousal is being activated to get something done and to finish it and complete it. And think about this. How many times have you had, for those of you who have children, have had a situation where it's Sunday night, you're already laughing. You all already know this, right? It's about 9.30 at night, and you hear from the other side of the house, Mom, I've got a research project due tomorrow, or something like that, history project, some kind of, and you're like, you know, you're just settled down, finally got them all, and so you yell back, what? And they yell back, I got a research project due tomorrow. And so you yell, how long have you known about this? And all of a sudden, it's quiet. You hear nothing. And then you hear, like, I don't know. You know, this kind of, like, response. Okay, so you march over to their room, and you say, well, let me see that paper. And so you take the paper from them. And like a good teacher, this teacher has put in, like, big, bold letters, (laughs) research project due on Monday, da-da-da-da-da. I mean, if they could make it light up on a piece of paper, I mean, I mean, because they put, like, exclamation points and little diagrams all around it. So it's clear that this project has been due. And you're like, or you may have been like the really on top of it parent. And even, you know, Friday night, they said, Mom, you know, I want to go to, you know, um, Joe's house tomorrow morning. And you're like, OK, do you have anything due this weekend? Let's talk about it. And they're like, well, yeah, I got this research project due. And you're like, OK, well, you get up Saturday morning. I'll make you a big breakfast. And then you get on that research project. And then when you're done, you can go. So you get him up early, he eats his nice breakfast, he goes up to his room, he, you hear all this kind of busy stuff happening up there, <laughs> and then he comes down and he's like, hey mom, I'm gonna go to Joe's. And you're like, did you get this stuff done? Oh yeah, and he's gone, right? And nothing, nothing has happened. I mean, you know, maybe he pulled out the paper and God opened his like, you know, composition book or whatever, and that was it, that's all that happened. Who knows what happened during that day probably some phone time, maybe some on game, you know, online gaming time, some music, a nap, you know, watch some Netflix off of his phone, something like that. Anyway, so that's what we mean by activation and arousal. So it's the ability to go, okay, this is something important I need to do, and the ability to sustain that, right? So maybe he was all gung-ho after the breakfast, got in there, laid everything out, and then his phone went off a little bit and just boop, you know, and he was gone. He was working on this stuff. So that's what we're talking about, activation and arousal. So starting it, sustaining it, finishing it, right? That's another part of executive functioning. So when you think about that, you know, it doesn't, none of these things happen immediately. It's not like the switch is a permanent on, right? What we see in regards to these skills is that they turn on, they didn't work the next time. They turn on, they didn't work the next time. But you hope over time that it's this kind of gradual increase. You know, there may be some dips, but over time they go from point A, you know, to here, but it's a lot of trial and error along the way. So, and I will mention that there are always outliers. There's those super duper 10 year olds that stay that way for the rest of their life, which is great in some ways, but also really not good in other ways because they're holding you accountable for everything and highly anxious and all that kind of stuff. And then there's those that never actually develop these skills, right? So know that this is kind of normal development, but there's always outliers in the, in the system. All right, so another part of executive functioning is what we call emotional control. So let me kind of give you another scenario. So you have a 15-year-old daughter maybe 16, depending on how cautious you are as a parent. 
She's been doing great in school, right? She's got A's and B's in school. She's in every club you can imagine. Um, there's an end of the year party. She really wants to go to that party. It's going to be at a kind of a friend's house, an acquaintance house. You know the parents from booster club or some kind of you know sports thing or club thing. Um, <laughs> You've confirmed that they are they're going to be there for the party. You've confirmed that they're not serving alcohol because now we have a social, social ordinance, social host ordinance. Everyone aware of that social host ordinance? That you cannot, as an adult, serve alcohol while youth are present or you'll be held, it's a city ordinance, you'll be held accountable. Because um, what was happening is parents were sending their kids to parties and the adults there were giving their children alcohol. So there's... Now, $300 fine for the first and 500 for the second, and everyone thereafter. Yes, so no social hosting. All right, so you've confirmed that they know that they're not going to host, um, but you've also confirmed that this is a, you know, a boys and girls party. It's a party. It's, you know, music, all that kind of stuff. So, so she begs and pleads, and, you know, you're like, oh, okay, you can go. So she is pumped, right? The party's in six weeks. She's already gone to H&M like five times to shop. You know, she's looked online for outfits, so she's picked herself this great outfit out. She's got a little skirt, this cute little top with a jacket, which you hope she wears because the top is a little revealing, but um, these cute sandals to go with it. She's pumped. She just talks about all the time, what she's going to do with her hair, how she's going to wear her makeup, all that kind of stuff. So on the day of the party, um, you even give her permission because she begs and she's been doing great, you even give her permission to ride to the party with somebody else. You know the girl. You know her family really well. She's a good driver, relatively speaking. Um, um, so you're like, okay. And so she's super excited, right? It's like her first big girl moment, if you want to call it that. So the day comes. The car shows up. They honk. I'm gone, Mom. I'm gone. You don't have to come out. I'm fine, fine. You know, thank you, Mom. So she runs outside runs out to the car. Her friend Kim is driving. We, everyone's cool with that. Mom said it was okay, all that. Next to Kim is um, Susie. You know, Mom didn't know Susie was coming, but you know, Mom knows Susie. It's cool. I'll just go get in the back seat. But in the back seat, there's Joe, right? So Mom definitely doesn't know Joe's coming in the car. And um, you, she knows Joe. The daughter knows Joe. She's heard that Joe's been to other parties, that he slipped some girl something at one of the parties and then took pictures of them, you know, doing stuff and then spread it around school, right? So what does this girl do, right? Emotional regulation, being able to control your emotions. She has been counting on this party for weeks, right? So excited about this party, pumped up. I mean, so she's beyond happy about this party. What does she do now? How does she respond? So hold on to that story because we're going to revisit in a second, okay?